be the rebel of the facts. But this is Milton Askew's bar. And according to the Historical Society, down the street somewhere here, there was a fire during the day. A little girl whose life was almost lost. Um, things were thrown up into arms and that everybody should gather at uh, Milton Askew's bar and 37 men donated a dollar to become a member of the Bernard Fowl Volunteer Fire Department. And that dollar was used to buy buckets and axes and ladders and was stored. And so that, according to, to a historical record, is how the Bernard Fire Department started. In 1885, almost in the spot where the fire was at, the two-story fire station was built along with the, whoops, I had myself here, along with the hose drying tower. And this was a, this is a gas street lamp that sat out in front of the, in front of the station. This may have been part of the original shed where they stored the buckets and the ladders, it, that I don't know. I wasn't, I really wasn't. <laughs> so, and as I mentioned, you know, it was all about the uniforms and outdoing the the other boys. Um, but there were also about 140 volunteer firemen for the Brigham Fire Department. So, um, from the north side of town and east, where the railroad shops were at, Brigham was a big railroad town. Um, to the south side. Um, and probably based on the fact of who could get there, who was closest, and uh, who was working during the day, who was available at night, um, staffing, staffing was an issue. Um, in Iowa City, it was not until 1965 that Iowa City actually became a full-time paid fire department. Uh, 19, eight, 1961, when the new fire station was built, connected to City Hall, as it is now, there were, there were still volunteers on the department at that point in time. This is another uh, group of firefighters from different area in Brady. So these were these were Brady's horses. And I had at one point, I don't have their name at this point in time, but uh, most of the horses were were rented from the livery stable until the station was built. And then they decided it was more uh, economical. It was also faster to respond to the fire to have your own horses. But in 1919, Brainerd got mechanized and bought their first 1919 pumper. And so the horses were sold to the local Brainerd Brewery Company. <laughs> Unfortunately, the horses were still trained. They were trained that when, when the alarm went off, they were in a stall. The stall gate came open. The horses came out. They came roughly to this position. Harnesses dropped from the ceiling. They were hooked up into the horse, into the harnesses, and then they were backed up by the engineer to hook up to the fire wagon and then leave. Well, as the story goes, the horses had been sold to the brewery company. They were out with the brewer making a delivery on Front Street of bottles of beer, cases of beer, and cakes of beer when the fire bell went off let the city firefighters know that it was time to report to the station. The horses thought it was time to go to work. They were unattended. And so the story is that they wheeled around and ran spewing cakes, bottles, and beer three city blocks back down to the station. Again, 1919, uh, Brainerd became mechanized. Here's the old station, and you can actually see the fire truck here with guys riding on the back. I joined the Brainerd Fire Department in 1980, and uh, we call my generation of firefighters the last of the tailboard riders because OSHA, of course, stepped in. It was very unsafe. Uh, our trucks were a little better than this, but uh, 
there was still a possibility that you could fall off of that. You know, this, this is the old station. In this area, approximately here, in 1845, the, the first modern station uh, with sleeping quarters up above and a kitchen in back uh, was built just down the block from the original station. This was the station as it looked when I joined the department in, uh, in 1980. Although you would have known from the vehicles. Uh, this, was, this was the city hall, this was the jail, and uh, we also had a we also had a fire pole, old pole. And uh, I I did get to slide down one more time. This is an Iowa City captain at Canal. Uh, this is the fire that was here in 1955. What's interesting in this picture is the fact that if you look at Ed's coat, corduroy collar, rubber coat, plastic hat. When I joined the department, this is 1955. When I joined the fire department in 1980, that was my coat and my hat, rubber coat, corduroy collar, and uh, plastic, basically a plastic hat. Gas mask, back at this point, this is, uh, uh, We've got John Fay and Herman Billauer. Uh, these were basically almost World War II gas masks. If you think of it, they were a canister mask. Um, the problem with the mask is the fact that it would, uh, it would get clogged with smoke and really become inoperable. So the term smoke here is that it was easier to stick your face right down in front of the nozzle and get fresh air from the water spray than it was to try and choke air out of one of these masks. SCBA, self-contained breathing apparatus, that came around later in, uh, for the fire service in, in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, on our department, I think for 40 of us, we had four of them. And so the practicality, you used it very minimally. Um, you had to go to the local fire extinguisher company in order to get it recharged. They weren't convenient. You didn't have canisters to, to regenerate your own oxygen at your own station. So we ate small. Um, our, gear, our gear did improve. Um, this is me in the middle, Kevin Stunick and, and Denny Bola. Um, we got longer coats. We still had pull-up boots, and uh, but the helmets improved a little bit. But we still weren't wearing air packs. And uh, this was back about 1983. Training force at that point in time, there really was no fire academy at that point. There was not like CLC or other firefighter programs, and so most of it was on the job. I was handed a pair of boots, some gloves, a helmet, a coat. Said. Hook on to an old guy and listen to him and make sure you stay alive. That was, you know, that was the, that was the training. Uh, training progressed and got a lot better uh, through the 80s. And uh, um, it was in 1979 that Firefighter 1, Firefighter 2 programs started coming about. So training of 147 hours, um, teaching you <clears throat> about how to enter a building, how to use a hose. It, I mean, that was the that was the infant stage of it. But a fire degree did not actually come about until about 1990. And so the fire here also evolved. Um, no max coat and hands came about. The no max hood. Uh, no max cover to protect the back of the neck, heavier rubber boots, and, and fire resistant, not fire proof, but fire resistant gloves. Uh, the other thing was that this gear now added about 100 pounds to your physical structure. So staying, staying in shape 
was extremely important. Then if you threw your air pack on, if you ended up having to do a high-rise bundle to stuff into a hydrant, and you needed to carry extra air packs because you were going up 10 or 12 flights, you got 40 pounds on the air pack, you've got about another 100 pounds here, so you're, you're hauling 275, 300 pounds on top of your body weight. Um, and we don't use elevators because elevators have a tendency to fail. So if you go back to 9-11 and you think about those guys going up, as far as they went up, many of them had this that they were carrying, hoping to rescue and save somebody else's life. So in 1987 was our first downtown fire in Brainerd. It started at 2 o'clock in the morning. There was a gas leak inside the local drugstore, Robert's truck. And we were on the scene for 40 hours um, before we got it out. We, we lost three quarters of the city block, but uh, we saved the local bridal shop and the VFW. So, also in 1987 was the beginning of my indoctrination into the DNR and the forest fire. Raymond sits on the edge of the villager in the Chippewa Forest, which is a far southern forest. Most of us are familiar with the lake. With the Superior National Forest up around Duluth, the Arrowhead, Dunfin Trail, and that area. But we had a series of fires that came about in 1987, uh, Pine Center Fire, Nimrod Fire, and the DNR was scrambling for fire personnel who could help them with cleanup, mop up, as well as fighting them. The fire, Brainerd being the largest fire department in the area, and we started to assist. And we actually, there were 10 of us that formed a 10 man crew of smoke chasers and uh, would go out off shift and on the weekends to help the firefighter, to help the DNR mop up and clean up the fires. So we were by no means uh, hot shots. Um, in 1987, the term one really didn't. Uh, exist, but uh, smoke chasers is probably the best description for us, and that has stayed through the career over the years. The gear for uh, fighting wildfire is a lot different. You have basically have a Nomax pair of pants, a Nomax shirt, not that much more than a safety helmet. Um, this is on average about a 45 pound pack. You carry your water with you for the day, and you go out at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning with a sack lunch, and you come home at 9.30, 10 o'clock at night when uh, the fire is out, or <clears throat> at that point in time, it was no longer safe to continue fighting fire in the dark. Um, night burns have become a, a popular uh, way of stealing the fuel source from the fire. Uh, this is for a control burn. Uh, they're done at night because of the fact that temperatures are lower. Uh, the winds go down at night. So the possibility of the fire getting away from you is a lot less. It doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, but it, uh, it's a fire, it's a defensive firefighting technique that is oftentimes used. And you've heard about it probably in California, in Idaho, other areas out west and down south. This, by the way, was was my crew. This was this was our uh, battalion chief, Jerry Thompson, good friend of mine, Fred Underhill. Uh, this is Chris Tollison, the first woman on the Brady Fire Department. This was in uh, 1983. We think about the progressiveness. Iowa City had their first woman on the fire department in 1978. First woman firefighter was in 1815. Her name was Molly Williams. She was on the New York Fire Department. She was on the Ocean uh, Engine Company number 11. So, and uh, I don't know what importance it is to, to share, but of all things, she was a slave. And she volunteered for the fire department. So, very little history about that, but, it, but an interesting note. 1992 was our second downtown fire. This one was arson. Um, at this 
point in time, I had had uh, training in uh, search and rescue, confined space, ice water rescue, uh, steep angle. And uh, when we originally got there, before it totally blew up, uh, six of us crawled inside this building with hose and line to try to get into the downtown basement, into the basement. The average uh, city fire or a structure fire is somewhere between 800 and 1200 degrees. The average wildfire is anywhere from 1200 to 2000 degrees. So, wildfire, wildfire forest fires say that city fire fighters are crazy. City fire fighters say wildfire fire fighters are crazy. So. I retired as a captain. Um, in 2002, I had decided that uh, you know, if I was able to uh, take my pension, and after 9-11, I was looking at approximately 2,000 hours of recertification, as well as 240 hours of normal, uh, normal work. And it seemed to me at that point in time, I'm in northern Minnesota, I'm 52 years old, I've got a pension, I can hunt and fish my way through, through life, but uh, it, it gets kind of lonely when you're the only person that's off and everybody else that you know is still working. So these are other guys that, that I joined. Uh, many of these guys were in their 40s, and uh, these are some of the old guys. This is Jerry Thompson, our, our chief, which you saw in the other picture. Um, a lot of these guys were young guys who uh, helped me in my career and guys that I served with on the department. This was, this was the 1919 fire truck that you saw. We refurbished that and uh, we used that in parades. Um, we beefed it up a little bit. Earl Gallant, who was right here, actually worked for Burlington Northern and he was a big Ford advocate. So he had a little Pinto engine. So we dropped that in the front and uh, we would lay rubber and, uh, and drive race with a few of the other fire trucks and parades. So they went not to take us on after a while. So, But fire trucks obviously improved over the years and, and got a lot better, a lot more modern. And then wildfire came. As I mentioned, I couldn't let fish my way through life. Things got a little bit boring. And uh, I got a phone call to, uh, in 2007, to, uh, to come back and help fight wildfire. This, by the way, was the Barrows Fire, which happened uh, one mile south of Brainerd a month and a half after I retired from the fire department. <laughs> so, uh, so I got assigned to what's called a J-5, and that's, this little track vehicle here, we would go out and search out hot spots. We had a hose. You had about 500 gallons of water around here. You could put a blade on the front and you would go through a dig and churn up the area. Um, but I also learned at 57 years old that I was not in the same shape that I was when I was 52. And uh, it turned out to be a short season when they, I told them I did, I did not think I was going to be back. I didn't want to go back on a line. Um, when you're out on a fire line, you're actually digging through the earth by hand with your, what's called a Pulaski, uh, and you're digging down to the bedrock. You're removing the fire, and you move in sequence. So you, you take five or six strokes, and then you take a step, and the guy behind you, or gal behind you, picks up, and you continue. And you dig mile long, two mile trenches, and you do that from morning until night when you go back in and you make a decision that uh, am I going to eat? Am I going to take a shower? Am I going to call a wife? Or am I just going to go to sleep in my tent? So. That wasn't for me either. The thought of canoeing has always been really wonderful, but this is a picture from the Hamlet Fire in northern Minnesota, and the only way that we could get back 
back into the boundary waters was to actually canoe back in to the area because you couldn't take a motorized vehicle in there and it's not practical to uh, to jump and survive over water with a parachute. So I got a phone call in the fall of 2007. They asked me if I wanted to come back, but they asked me if I wanted to go work with the tanker boats. I told them I didn't know anything about aircraft. Having been in the Army, other than you didn't jump out of a perfectly good airplane, although there is no such thing. <clears throat> but I was, I was, I told them I knew how to make coffee, vacuum floors, and clean toilets. Uh, they told me that they would teach me everything else that I needed to know. And again, much like the early stages of firefighting, it was all done in what we call task books. So it's like taking a crash course with, with cliff notes. You're, you're researching airplanes, you're researching dispatch procedures, you're researching the protocol. And I traded uh, one crew in for another crew. This was everybody that worked, I worked with at the uh, freighted tanker base. And I traded my pickaxe and my Nomax gear in for an air-conditioned office with windows and airplanes. Problem is, after one or two seasons, that gets a little boring. Because you know, all the action is outside. So I decided I wanted to become an aircraft loader. That was the next step. And uh, this is this is a CL215. This is a water scooper that's used by the Air Force or used in fighting fire. They're also in Canada. We call them the ducks. Um, they're amphibious. They're designed to go down through the water, actually scoop up water. Uh, they've got two 700 gallon dairy tanks, plastic dairy tanks, on on the side. Shoots the water up. They can fly over the fire, they can gate the amount of water that's dropped out of the fire. But here we're, we're starting out in the morning, and so again, my friend Fred and I working together, uh, we're loading the aircraft with water. Then I decided to move on. I wanted to be a, I wanted to be what's called a parking tender, and so I learned how to marshal the aircraft. Uh, my wife, who's sitting in the back, came up and visited me one rainy season while we were still uh, working in Brainerd. This is the retardant area. You may have heard of, uh, you see the red stuff that's being dropped by the planes out of the sky. So this is the storage tanks of the red. We mix it with water. This is the pump house. And then we pump it out and fill up the plane and they can carry it to the fire. This is, this is foam, so it's almost like wet water. It's similar to Don Dishwalk machine liquid in many respects. And what it does is it breaks up the oxygen and the hydrogen in the water, which makes it wet water and allows it to soak into the grasses and everything. Um, this is a portable air tanker base. Not all bases are permanent. So sometimes where we would go, and in this case I went, I was down in Abilene, Texas. I decided I wanted to move from now being a parking tender, never satisfied, right? So I wanted to move on from being a parking tender to being a mix master. And being in Brainerd, I knew how to work with liquid, but I did not know how to work with powder. And that's what's in these bins. This, these are 2,000 pounds of powder. This was back in 2011 when Texas was on fire <clears throat> from November of the year before into September of 2011. So, let's see. These are the, these are the mixing tanks. Those, those bins are on the other side of the tanks right here off the trailer. And uh, we mix that with water. We churn it around inside the mixing tanks, and then we transfer it through this snaking of hose, and we're storing it in 4,000 gallon storage tanks. And the reason we're doing that at this point in time in 2011, we were mixing 2,400 gallon, 24,000 gallons of retardant a day, uh, and uh, we were running out. The fires were so close, and we had so many planes that we were filling the planes up with 
3,000 gallons at a time. And there was a point in time that during the day, we would actually run out of retardant. We had to put, we basically had to put the fire on hold or the aircraft on hold. So the fire had to grow in size. And we lost the ground from what we were able to accomplish in the morning until we could catch back up. That was in the first, uh, my first 30 day tour there. While I was there in the first 30 days, we made the decision to add two more 5,000 gallon tanks. So we now have the capability that we could put together roughly 12,000 gallons at a time, 12 to 14,000 gallons at a time, we have it sitting. We cascaded the system so that we would peel off the back. We were still mixing in the front. As we emptied the back one, we filled it, came on to the next, on to the next, on to the next. By the time we hit this one, these two or three tanks had settled down and we could start filling. So we never ran out of retardant again. And uh, it made for really long days. Because we went to work at 7.30 in the morning and we would oftentimes not get done until 11 o'clock at night. But we helped stop fires. This is another portable seat base, uh, portable mixing base. Not every place we go did we have city water, so we would oftentimes, we would have to put up this bladder, and we would have to call the local fire department in order to come in with their tankers and backfill the water for us if we didn't have hydrants on the airport or in the remote location where we were at. So this, this would hold roughly 3,000 gallons of water. Then we would use that to mix retardant, and then in this case, this is a seat, which is kind of like a glorified spray plane. Uh, we clean out the hopper. We, um, we then use the same drop system off the belly to uh, lay the retardant down on top of the fire. But uh, this one holds roughly 750 gallons for something a larger aircraft will hold uh, 2,000 to 2,800 gallons. This was in uh, this was in Portland, Idaho, and this is another. Uh, this is a contract retardant plant. This is actually by a company called Spaz Check that makes the retardant. What's interesting here is uh, this is the air quality that we're often dealing with during the day. So uh, the disadvantage is we don't have breathing apparatus that will last and allow us to work with that. So. Carcinogens that were, were not inhaling during structure fires, they're now finding that we were inhaling the same carcinogens out in the uh, forest fires. And that's becoming a bigger concern in California with all the fires that they're having and the cities and the houses you know, that they're now losing because of the plastics and everything which is involved. This is a DC-10, which has been converted into an air tanker. This was one of the first big uh, tankers to come about. Um, they strip everything out of the middle of it. There's no seats, there's, there's no, uh, what do I say? Not most of the station, but uh, um, there's no flight attendants in there. So you, know, I mean, so you can't get in there. If you want a cup of coffee, you gotta leave the cockpit in order to go back and get it yourself, which really isn't advised when you're, you're flying around. But this, this plane actually held 11,650 11, gallons, and it still does. And uh, there are now three of them, which are being used out west on the California fires. Um, in this case, I have become a mix master at this point in time, so I'm here filling it up with 11,000 gallons. That the bad news in this case was, luckily this was kind of a show and go for the local airport, trying to convince them to beef up uh, our ramp so we could hold their heavier airplanes. All we had was a 40 gallon a minute trash pump and uh, trying to put 11,600 gallons of water into a plane at 40 gallons. Of, it took a long time. <laughs> so, unfortunately this was the next day in Minnesota. So we had, we had 45 degrees one day, and we had 23 inches of snow the next. So the fire season in Minnesota, you never know what's going to happen. Um, we would start in February. We could be done in March. 
We might be done in April. Um, this year, they ran all summer. In fact, uh, I just heard yesterday that they were finally sending planes home from the fires that were existing in the Chippewa, the Superior. You may have heard about the, uh, the Glenwood fire up the, in the boundary waters as well as the one that was up on the Flint Trail. So, and as recently as, let's say, Wednesday, Monday, there was a fire in between Brainerd and Grand Rapids in a town called Hill City that, uh, that they were flying on. So it's extremely, extremely dry up there. Uh, this is another shot of uh, Colorado. So in 2012, I decided, okay, I went through everything. Uh, I've done all the basic loop stuff. I've been a dispatcher, I've been a tender, I've been a loader, I've been a mix master, I've been a ramp manager. So I decided I wanted to try the, the big job, almost like the fire chief. So I was able to go to Northern California and with Cal Fire and the U.S. Forestry, I took the uh, tanker base manager course to be able to manage tanker bases, manage the aircraft, manage the uh, uh, contracts and uh, personnel. And um, I actually did that from roughly 2013 through 2019 when I completely retired from uh, the fire service altogether. Uh, but one of the things that I ran into while I was there was smoke jumpers. Interesting story about the smoke jumpers. The smoke jumpers actually started in the forestry after World War II. Uh, might have been members of the 82nd Airborne. Uh, they might have jumped in Normandy, all over the country. Uh, but the Forest Service needed a way to be able to get into the remote areas, and jumpers wanted to do something after they got out of the service. So smoke jumping became um, an occupation. This is a very elite group. These guys get dropped in with all the gear they need. They put the fire up and then they walk their way out, all gear included. One of their first jobs is they need to learn how to sew. They actually sew each outfit is custom made for them as an individual. There's some basic ideas, the, the pouches, uh, the neck protection, uh, the wire basket that they wear over their head to protect them from the trees, but they, they actually build their own parachutes. They learn how to string parachutes, pack their parachutes, much, much the same way as they did if, uh, if they were airborne uh, with the military. In the early stages of Vietnam, the uh, airborne actually came to the U.S. forestry because they have experience in jumping through dense foliage and so they needed somebody to teach the rangers how to jump through uh, the, the jungle foliage uh, in both in uh, Vietnam and uh, in Cambodia. So a lot of the guys switched for a short period of time and actually worked for the airport, or worked for uh, the US government again. So this became my path. This was everything that I had. It was constantly packed. And as my wife, Carol, would attest, basically from the 1st of February until the 1st of October, I was gone at any point in time for 30 days. Um, I was generally home for about three, but I was never really home, because as she would attest, I was always watching where the next fire was and looking for where the next assignment was going to be. So um, it became a way of life. and. Uh, I actually kind of fulfilled the second career that I had planned on being a Minnesota smoke chaser. I worked in Billings, Montana. This, if any airplane buffs out there, this is a P2B. It's a uh, Korean War vintage, early 50s. We also used P3s, which were uh, sub chasers. Those were the first planes that uh, I worked with. This was our, our wonderful cafeteria. Uh, you are not uh, overly fed. This is where you get your morning cup of coffee and your, and your bag lunch for the day. You got an apple, a dry sandwich, uh, maybe some jello. This is our staging area. 
I was given the opportunity to work at Phoenix um, Interagency Fire Center. This is called the Mecca of, uh, of all fire bases. It's down in Gateway in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I ran into an old buddy of mine um, while I was there with the, uh, with the DC-10 and had him on base. I was the tanker manager there at that point in time. This was a contract base, so this is the retirement, which is next to the loaded. Um, this is Randy Carter from Arkansas, Eric Smith, and Jason Peterson, and we're out on the wing with an EC-10. Um, so in many ways for us, you know, airplane buff or uh, it had some perks. In Boise, Idaho is the Wildland Firefighter Monument. Uh, this is dedicated to all the firefighters that we've lost over the years, going back uh, into the early 50s. So if uh, you've done any reading about fires, if you're familiar with Van Gulch, Storm King, or in our case, the Yarnell, uh, I had the unfortunate opportunity of being the tanker base manager uh, on the day of the Yarnell, uh, which is just up by Prescott. Arizona, and we were flying on that fire that day, and we lost the 19. And we had to divert all of our guys to go from fighting the fire to uh, search and rescue and aerial reconnaissance. So, um, fire, wildfire is a strange creature. Uh, you're talking about the big fires out in California. They get so large, they get to a point. Uh, Usually when they get to what we call a complex, but they develop their own weather. Uh, they can have their own lightning. Uh, they can develop a mushroom cloud that will go thousands of feet, tens of thousands of feet in, in the air, and uh, they create their own wind. And that's why it has become almost impossible to put out. Sometimes we just have to wait for Mother Nature. Um, if you recall in 1987, the Yellowstone fire, that's actually what happened. Firefighters didn't put that out, Mother Nature got the snow. And uh, that's what actually stopped the fire in Yellowstone. Also, I had the opportunity to work with the military. These are C 130 uh, Hercules. And uh, we got really taxed with private aircraft fighting fire. Uh, 2012, the Air Force, or the uh, Forestry said that the P2Vs and the, and the P3s were not fit to uh, fly anymore. They were worried because they we're now talking, you know, 2012, and these were aircraft that were built in the 40s and 50s. They were worried that they were going to fall apart. So they activated the, uh, the military with a C-130, and they developed what they called the MAVS system. This was a mobile air firefighting system, totally remote. They could load this into the back of a C-130 in 30 minutes. Uh, it would hold 2,000 gallons of retardant. This is a pressurized air tank that we filled from the ground. And we had to have our own water source. Compressors to put the air in, pumps to pump the retardant in. And uh, they are still used today. They're activated. They've been active now. California fires since uh, probably the first part of June. So this is this is Boise. Uh, this is the Boise Ram. Gentleman right here in the middle is Les Dixon. He's the uh, tanker base manager. But this is Boise. It's the national headquarters for uh, wildfire and forest fires. This is where all the communications, all the data reports, incident reports, everything that we find out is what's going on, how many personnel, how many aircraft you comes out of this building right here. And there's also Boise smoke jumpers in this building. This is Stan Good in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. If uh, any World War II buffs are in here, this is at Pappy Boynton Field. This is where Black Sheep Squadron is at. Pappy Boynton, uh, actually born and raised in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And uh, Stan is the tanker base manager there. He, uh, brought me in to, uh, to help manage a ramp on the north side, opposite of where his tanker base was at. And uh, we call this the uh, North Ramp Pirates. So. This was an interesting, uh, an interesting job. What do you do after you become tanker base manager? 
you and I, when an opportunity comes to become a liaison officer, to work with the Forest Service and in between the Forest Service, the National Guard, the uh, state, and in this case it was the uh, state of Virginia, and Hurricane Sandy, while it hit the East Coast, it, uh, oh, the batteries are really low. That's not good. Um, Joey's from Garrison, Minnesota. So, 
He did Tanker Race. I had the opportunity to work in uh, Healy, Minnesota, and uh, actually didn't have to go too far for, for fires on any given day. Uh, but there is, there is a greater connection, I think, with, with nature, with wildfire, than I even ever realized. The places that I got to go, the people that I got to meet, the things that I got to see, so much different than working in structural firefighting. Um, I did have an opportunity to work in Washington. Um, biggest advantage about being out in Washington is the fact that when you're there with the fresh cherries and the fresh peaches and the fresh apricots are coming out. It's, it's really great to just drive by the sand and pick up an inexpensive bag. I to work with a gentleman by the name of Eric Johnson. Eric, this is a fire boss. He's much like the big scooper that you saw, the yellow one for the ducks. Um, they basically take the, um, the seat, the crop dusting plane, they put it on the mountains, and uh, it uses this not only to scoop up the water and shoot it up into the hopper, but it allows mobility that they don't have to come back to an air base in order to get refilled up. And now they've gone to an online system where we can fill them up with the uh, foam retardant, and so they can mix it right on the plane um, so we're constantly evolving through the Forest Service on better ways to fight fire. We now use more seats than uh, when we use large aircraft uh, because they're faster and the time that it takes a large air tanker to drop its load, go back to an air base, pick up 2,000 gallons and come back, this plane can make 14 drops using local water source of a lake, particularly in Minnesota. So, um, this is their little retardant tart tart base that goes with them. Um, so you've got your mixing tank, your retardant sits here, your water sits up here. It's all designed so they can mix it together. And they have their own tenders so they can actually blow from a remote location anywhere that they can drop the trailer and land the plane. So, a good shot working in Washington of all the planes when they're just they're doing their practices. So uh, it's awesome to see what these guys are able to do with those planes and, and how they fly. So, <laughs> so it was time to exit. Um, you know, sometimes you don't get clear direction when it's time to leave, but uh, you know, you do get the idea the words are the same. So uh, I've been very fortunate to realize a childhood dream that I did not. Uh, maybe recognized in 1957 and uh, was very happy uh, with my career, very proud to share and appreciate the opportunity. I know I've gone pretty long and we like to be out of here but if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Yes? Well, I wondered, uh, the Australian fires were so bad and I didn't know if there was any difference in the fire itself or fighting a fire in some place like Australia. And I hear that the, the trees are so filled with oil that they explode. You know, the, the trees. Um, uh, so, well, I mean, I'm they, just they, curious. They, you know, I mean, so the drought and the effect of lack of water you know, creates an issue for, for any forest. And uh, uh, so the, the fires in Australia, yeah, the magnitude of the fires is, is, is unbelievable. Uh, I'm not familiar with the, with the trees so much in Australia as I am for the mesquite trees in Texas, which are also a very oily tree, which will also explode, or the pine trees of the Pacific Northwest and Northern Minnesota, which are the same way, the, the pitch and the tar. The heat gets so much that the canopy, yeah, it just just explodes. Um, great thing is, if there is such a thing in in wildfire, is the fact that there is a great reciprocation between the United States and Australia, and Australia and the United States. We had the Australian firefighters here um, back in 2016, uh, working up in the Pacific Northwest, and I know we have. We sent planes. Um, there are a lot of the guys that do the fire buses and the seats. 
um, and the DC-10 have actually flown over and have bought the fires down in Australia and in New Zealand. So I don't know if that answers all your questions. Yes, ma'am. What is the retardant made out of? Well, that's a that's a that's a top secret because <laughs> the uh, uh, Fozcheck, which was actually a company out of India, uh, didn't want to release all of their information. Somebody knows it's some are obvious their chemists, but it has fertilizer in it, it has clay in it, it has iron oxide in it, and then it has a bunch of other ingredients that you know you must need. It classification higher than the President of the United States in order to have that demolished. But the fertilizer helps to regenerate uh, the undergrowth uh, and the, uh, the clay is there simply for the weight in order to take everything down. The iron oxide is there in order to be able to see it after it's been spread out. Uh, what I can tell you is it's, it's very heavy when 2,000 gallons comes out of the plane, uh, and it does stain your clothes. And I'll just say that from being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I can get the full 2,000 gallons. So very good to be safe here. Thank you. That's really an interesting answer. Anybody else? Do you live in Iowa City? I live in Iowa City. How did you get to Iowa City? Pardon? How did you get to Iowa City? Well, I was born and raised here. So I was born and raised here, and I left in, I left in, after I came out of the service in 1972, my philosophy of the world and, and college life didn't exactly melt, and so I was looking for a job, and I was almost ready to re-enlist when uh, I got offered a job up in Minnesota. So I lived up there for 32 years. Um, my wife and I reconnected at a 35th class reunion. And uh, someone advised me that it might be a good idea if I was going to marry the gal, I should probably go where she did. So I, my, since my job was such that I was off four to five months out of the year and then a phone call and, and I'm gone, uh, I moved back down in, in uh, 2008 and, and uh, we got married. I moved down in, in February. And uh, 10 days after I moved down with uh, 32 years of guy stuff, um, I got dispatched out. I basically came home in October. Um, my stuff was not out on the street, so I figured she's going to let me stay. And I've been here ever since. And, and it's good to be home. So I would say it's changed quite a bit since uh, 1972. Like the town's going this way, the town's going that way, and North Liberty was a little over 300 people, and it's close to 20,000, wow. So, yeah. Anybody else? All right, thank you very much.